So I'll do a share screen. So for those of you joining us, good morning. I apologize for the unorthodox to entry to today's lecture. So you had asked about the Donahue equation for shell side heat transfer coefficients. where we were looking at for applying the Donahue, no salt is equal to HO, DO over K, 0.2, Reynolds, which is GE, DO over mu to the 0.6, Prandtl to the 0.33, and then this viscosity thing, right, to the 0.14. And what that's describing is for a fluid flowing around on a shell, right? You can have a bulk temperature of the fluid, which indicates a certain viscosity, right? But where the heat transfer is occurring is at the intersection of that fluid and the, t the pipe. And so if that pipe temperature is a different temperature, that implies there's a secondary viscosity if those, especially if the temperatures are very different, right? If, if, if the fluid on the inside is much hotter than the fluid on the outside, that viscosity is gonna be a lot lower and vice versa. If the fluid on the inside is much colder, that viscosity is gonna be a lot higher. And so this mu W is essentially the viscosity of the shell side fluid. at the temperature of the pipe, right? So this would be T pipe, if you want me to make it even more detailed. And this is T of shell fluid. So it's essentially a small correction factor because you know once again, it's up to the 0.1 power to account for if there's drastic changes in fluid viscosity. Did you have any other questions, Mitch? Yes, sir. Go for it. You discussed only a few properties about the which fluids we should put in the shell side and which fluids we should put in the tube side. And yes. You, all, you said four properties. Are is there any more like specifics you would say we should put in a tube rather than put it in the outside? You, you said um, viscosity, corrosive. Yeah, I gave you a few kind of rules of thumb. Beyond what I stated in class, and, and if you want, I can restate it. I don't mind saying the same thing twice. That gives you another opportunity to kind of get it. You know, so we said for high velocity fluids, you know, put it in the tube side for corrosive or high pressure fluids. Put it in the shell side. And for high viscosity fluids, or excuse me, tube side. I can't talk and think at the same side and write. we would want to put that in the shell. And beyond that, the best thing you can I do is if you have, you know, fluid A, that has, you know, M sub A and properties, dot, 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 versus fluid B, with its mass flow rate and properties, right? And you're looking to say, okay, what's the best thing to do tube side versus shell side? And if you don't have any sort of special considerations, what you can do 
is you can calculate HI versus HO for fluid A, whether you put it in the shell or the tube, right? And you can calculate HI versus HO if you put fluid B in the shell and the tube, right? And that what you can do then is you can calculate what I'm going to call U1 and U2, right? And U1 would be fluid A in tubes, fluid B in shell, and U2 would be fluid B in tubes. I don't know why my pen's not working. Probably I don't push down far enough. Fluid A in shell, right? So if this was a true design question and you had the time and the expertise, all you need to do is calculate essentially these two overall heat transfer coefficients, right? depending on whether one, what you pick in the tube and the shell, then you flip it and recalculate your overall heat transfer coefficient. And then you just pick the higher U value, whatever is gonna get you the higher overall heat transfer coefficient, that tells you what to put in the tubes, that tells you what to put in the shell. Assuming you don't have any sort of, you know, quote unquote, special consideration for your system, right? So then you just choose the higher overall heat transfer coefficient because that's going to give you the most efficient heat transfer. The only thing I would say is you have special considerations when I'll say special consider oh, like a spell considerations exist with fluids involving phase chains. And we'll get to that later today. Right, so if you have something evaporating or condensing, that's going to change your answers, right? And at the same time, if you have a reactive system, right, so if you've got, you know, a a chemical reactor that's also being um, designed to operate similar to a heat exchanger. For example, I can very easily imagine kind of like a, a shell and tube heat exchanger where, here I'm gonna put the shell here where I've got a bunch of tubes that are full of packing. So I'll say, you know, tube in here, tube out here. And then for my shell side, I would have some sort of um, boiler feed water and then some like medium pressure steam. And in these types of situations, what you have is you have a bunch of tubes full of catalyst. And essentially these tubes are surrounded with water. And so as the reaction proceeds, if it's an, assuming this is an exothermic reaction, that heat that is produced by the reaction is then transferred to the boiler feed water, which leaves the process as medium pressure steam. And so this, you can have this reactor that's really designed as a shell and tube heat exchanger, right? Because you wanna make sure that the temperature in your reaction system is you know, properly controlled. And, and, and the best way to control that is definitely through a, a pressure control system. Right, so if you set the, the temperature of the, the steam to be released by the pressure, you can, you can regulate the, the heat transfer as well as the actual reaction temperature as it proceeds. And so, you know, there are, you know, instances such as that where this kind of 
view analysis isn't going to apply. So long answer, I'll admit, but very important nonetheless. Any other questions? I appreciate your questions, Mitch. Any other questions from anybody else? And I'm happy to clarify any any points that we've we've discussed this these past couple of weeks. All right, I'm not hearing anything else. So um, what we're gonna do today is wrap up our discussions of heat exchangers and probably jump into some of the discussion on boiling and condensing systems. So last time we had started discussing the Epsilon NTU method. And this is a system to analyze existing heat exchangers to identify their effectiveness when put into surface. And this differs then from what we do with the you know heat exchanger design equation because in that case we're saying hey I've got fluids I've got certain flow rates and temperatures that I would like to see in my system what does the heat transfer area and essentially size and cost of that heat exchanger need to be to make that happen for this type of analysis it's more so I have you know a hot stream coming in you know. I know it's heat capacity, I know it's the temperature coming in, and vice versa, I have a cold stream coming in. And I wanna know, you know, given a heat exchanger, hold on buddy, given a heat exchanger, what's the expected outlet temperatures? I will be right back. Hold on one moment. All right, I'm back. So, absolute NTU method, given a heat exchanger, what are the expected outlet temperatures? Based off of two values, the first one being NTUs or the number of heat transfer units in an exchanger. Which we can calculate as the overall heat transfer coefficient U times the heat exchanger surface area A divided by the MCP min involved in my process. I can compare that to the capacity ratio for my heat exchanger, which is the MCP min over the MCP max to identify my expected effectiveness epsilon, which is a analysis of Q over Q max, where if Q max 
is going to be can be determined by MCP min times T H N minus T C N. And the actual Q such that I can also calculate epsilon as TH out minus TCN over THN minus TCN. So right at the end of class, we started an example looking at the epsilon NTU method where we had a hot stream of oil coming in at 30,000 kilograms per hour and a cold stream of water coming in at 2,400 kilograms per hour. The heat capacity of the oil was approximately 2.3 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And the heat capacity of the water was 4.18 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And if the T hot in was approximately 110 degrees and T cold in was I think 25 degrees, what would be the expected outlet temperatures? I'll say THI equals what and TC out equals what. And I also stated that UA given was 3.89 kilojoules, or excuse me, kilowatts per Kelvin. So for this problem, I can solve for my MCPs. which equals 3,000 kilograms per hour divided by 3,600 seconds per hour times the T capacity, 2.3 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And this will give me kilowatts per Kelvin. So I got about 1.92 kilowatts per Kelvin. My MCP on my cold side is equal to 2400 kilograms per hour times 3600 seconds in an hour times 4.18 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. By doing this calculation, I get about 2.79. Which tells me my MCP min is my hot side fluid, which means in this problem, the number of heat transfer units available is going to be 3.89 kilowatts per Kelvin divided by 1.92 kilowatts per Kelvin, which is equal to about 2, 2.03. And my capacity ratio is going to be 1.92 kilowatts per Kelvin divided by 2.79 kilowatts per Kelvin. or about 0.69. So I can solve for my epsilon using figure 15.8 on page 454 of your text. And I'll pull that up here in a second so you can see. If, uh oh, come on, pen. So, 
based on that. My at number of heat transfer units was two. And my capacity ratio here was about 0.69, so probably in between this 0.6 and 0.8 curve. So I get a value somewhere around here, which if I try to draw a line from there, so you can kind of see how I'm identifying that value, you get a value about 0 0.72, 0 0.73 for your effectiveness factor. So with that effectiveness factor in hand, I can then solve for my outlet temperature. So I'll say it's about 0.73, which is equal to TH out minus TCN over THN minus TCN, or TH out minus 25 degrees C over 110 minus 25 degrees C. So we get a TH out of approximately 87.1 degrees C. So I know I kind of flew through that problem. So let me zoom out so you can all kind of see the calculations. Make any note updates. Do you guys have any questions on that? Or do you kind of see how I was able to use the epsilon and TU expressions to solve for that outlet temperature. One thing I will say is that this figure eight is only for one one counter flow exchangers. So if you have like a shell in tubes, weird double pipes, cross flows, anything like that, you're gonna have to identify the effectiveness curve for that particular exchanger. And so, you know, those are things that you can identify. I know there's lots online. So you have to use the right curve for the heat exchanger that you have. So my next question to you all would be, how would I find TC out based on this? So Carl, what do you think? Um, not really sure to be honest. Okay, that's fine. Mitch, do you have an idea you wanna help him out? I'm also not sure as well, but uh, maybe log, log mean temperature difference. Um, you're on the right track. So the best way to do that is with this outlet temperature in hand, I can then solve for QH as MCP, TH in minus TH out, or, I had MCP was what, 1.92 kilowatts per Kelvin times 110 degrees minus 87.1. This gives me approximate value. Of 40, 
essentially 50 kilowatts. And since I know QH is equal to QC, that means QC is also equal to 50 kilowatts, which is equal to MCPC times T cold out minus T cold in. And with this in hand, I can then solve for the temperature of my cold in given MCPC is equal to 2.92 kilowatts per Kelvin, which means my delta T here is going to be 50 kilowatts divided by 2.92 kilowatts per Kelvin. Or 17.1 degrees. Which means my TC out is going to be 25 plus 17 degrees or 42.1 degrees Celsius. So it's just applying my thermodynamic principles. All right, so I had my input flows, my known heat capacities and my expected inlet temps based on the current design of the heat exchanger. If I put these fluids in, these are the temperatures I would expect to leave this, the unit operation. Any questions, comments, concerns, or complaints? Um, I don't know what to tell you. All right, there's a couple things I want to identify before we finish and wrap up our discussion on heat exchangers. The first one is a discussion on cross flow exchangers. So like the name implies, a cross flow exchanger, if you can imagine a tube bank where fluid is flowing perpendicular over and under those pipes, we would consider that a true cross flow exchanger. They're very useful when you're looking at running heat transfer um, involving gases. Primarily because when you're looking at gas-based systems, the heat capacities of those gases are fairly low. And so to get moderate temperature rises, you don't need a whole lot of heat and heat thermal energy input or, you know, removed from those systems. And so cross flow exchangers are good options for that. And so when it comes to cross flow, it, they operate similarly than shell and tube. By mean like that, I mean for the tube side, we use the Colburn equation. Right, new salt is equal to HIDO over K, which equals 0 0.023, Reynolds to the 0.8, times Brandle to the N. And for the shell side of a cross flow exchanger, we have new salt again, which is equal to HO, DO over K which equals to 0 0.287 times DO G over mu to the 0.61 times Prandtl to the 0.33 times 
F sub A. So G is simply the mass velocity. There's no effective mass velocity. But F of A is known as the arrangement factor for a cross flow exchanger, which is a function of two things, the flow Reynolds number in the shell, as well as the relative ratio of two pitch over the tube outlet diameter. And for you know an idea of some of these values, see table 15.1 on page 452. I will share a picture of what that looks like. They're, they're not major changes unless you're looking at really low Reynolds numbers. But for high Reynolds numbers, it's gonna be close to one. In some in instances, you can actually find an enhancement of your Neusel um, due to the arrangement factor. All right. The last exchanger that I would like to talk about are your plate and frame heat exchangers. And so Plate and frames are, are fairly common in the process industry. However, not nearly so much so as compared to shell and tube heat exchangers. For these, hold on buddy. Um, for these, give me one second. Dr. Lopez, well, it needs to be my mic, I couldn't hear you. Hello, hello, how's that? I can hear you now. Okay, yeah, I've got a secondary mute button on my headset, sometimes it hits itself. Thank you for letting me know. Sorry about that, leaving my, I'm watching my son this morning. So he wants to have lots of fun. So for plate and frames, we're looking at moderate temperature and pressures. And you know, the best way I can kind of show you this is information associated is if you can see this picture, 
we, you can see the kind of key design when it comes to a plate and frame. The fluid travels along these corrugated metal plates and the fluid is alternating between the cold fluid and the hot fluid. And there are gaskets available on these plates to ensure that the fluid is sealed within the heat exchanger. And as you can imagine, this metal on the frames allows really high efficient heat transfer between the two fluids. And you know, by doing this alternate fluid arrangement, essentially a hot fluid is surrounded by cold fluid and a cold fluid is surrounded by hot fluid. So we can get optimal heat transfer in that regard. The issues uh, associated with a plate and frame are those such that these flame, excuse me, these frames, the thickness and flow area for these systems is sufficiently small such that you're going to have fairly sizable pressure drops along these plate and frame exchangers. And so if you're looking at a high throughput system, you're probably going to consider a shell and tube more so than a plate and frame. But if you have uh, you know, a relatively moderate flow without too much associated with the desired heat transfer, a plate and frame module may be advantageous. Primarily because if you consider scale up and scale down or modification of this system, you know, manipulating the heat transfer area is fairly simple. All it involves is adding additional plates onto your heat exchanger. Because as you can see, you know, adding and removing plates is, is just a quick disassembly of this system. And so it's, there's good versatility in here. However, like I said, it's countered with the issue associated with you know, higher than anticipated pressure drops as compared to other heat exchanger types. Um, and when it comes to looking at the heat transfer coefficients for these plate and frames, you can see the equation here where new salt is a function of H times the effective diameter. Now we're not looking at tubes, so there's no real diameter. We're looking at an effective diameter over the thermal conductivity, where that effective diameter is simply two times the plate spacing or thickness for flow. And that is equal to 0.37 times your Reynolds number of the fluid to the 0.67 times per angle to the 0.33. So you can kind of see all these new salt numbers have that same form. However, depending on the actual nature of the heat exchanger, the empirical constants involved in determining new salt change. And so when you're looking at analyzing a process or designing a new heat exchanger, it's important to ensure you know you kind of know what type of exchanger you're looking at and how to calculate the new salt and heat transfer coefficient associated with that exchanger. Any questions on the plate and frame? Do you guys have a reasonable understanding after my explanation on how these kind of work? There, there's a lot of nuance when it comes to these plate and frames. I, I have an old PowerPoint from an AICHE meeting. If I can try to find it, I'd be more than happy to post it for you guys to review. Dr. Lopez? Of course, go ahead. What is the effective diameter for the plate and frame exchanger again? It's essentially double the plate spacing. Excuse me. Any other questions? All right, if not, we can go ahead, take a 60 second breather. And we can switch gears to talk about our next module section, which is that for 
I have to scroll down, sorry. Boiling and condensing. Now, there is one example in the lecture slides on plate and frames. I'm going to go ahead and work that out separately because I wasn't able to get it to it for the uh, section two of this class. And I'll just post that video of me working that example on Blackboard um, probably either this afternoon or tomorrow morning. And it's also, if you're interested in doing it yourself, that example is essentially a rehash of example 15.5 in your text on page 457 through 459. Like I said, there's a whole lot when it comes to heat exchangers. I'd love to get into some more of it, but I think with the structure of this class, you kind of have the sense of how to approach heat exchangers especially when it comes to design. You know, you have to identify, based on the exchanger type, what are the necessary equations for new salt? How do you identify the new salt based off of your anticipated Reynolds and Prandtl? Once you have a new salt number, you can then solve for your fluid heat transfer coefficients for both sides of your exchanger. With those in hand, then you can use the design equation to solve for any values of interest. All right, so we're coming up on one of the last, if not the last section for this class, which is a discussion on boiling and condensation. So when analyzing a system involving boiling and condensing, it is important to note the influence of temperature and pressure on vapor-liquid equilibrium. Meaning, at any given T and P, or temperature and pressure, we can consider systems where T is below the saturation temperature, P vaporization is greater than zero, and the vapor pressure is less than the saturation pressure. Meaning a good example of this Instead of flow through a pipe, I have water in a pot. Got to make sure the picture is there. or, you know, looking at a system or a pot of boiling water, 
you know, initially my temperature of the water is at some T. Where this temperature is less than the saturation temperature. P vape is greater than zero, right? The water is going to have some appreciable vapor pressure, but the that pressure is not going to be equal to the saturation pressure, right? So I'm going to have some form of vapor liquid equilibrium existing initially in this in this fluid system pot of water is a good example of this so a couple of things to note at the liquid vapor interface What type of equilibrium do we have? All right, Claire. What type of equilibrium do we anticipate at the interface? All right, let me move on to the next person, Alyssa. Will it be at vapor liquid equilibrium? Yes. Not a trick question. Say in the for all awake. So we have vapor liquid equilibrium at the vapor liquid interface. And as the liquid enters the vapor phase, what do we typically call that? Boiling or vaporization? You typically call that evaporation. So I would say evaporation occurs at the liquid vapor interface due to the vapor liquid equilibrium. within a steady state system, because we don't always have equilibrium. So meanings, you know, I call it evaporation when I have liquid essentially entering the vapor phase at that liquid vapor interface. When the vapor goes into the liquid phase, I call that condensation. That differs from boiling. Right, that's why this is called boiling and condensing, not evaporation and condensate condensing. And so how does that differ from boiling? And you know, my question then becomes, where is boiling going to occur? And Jasmine, let's see if you can answer that. So if evaporation occurs at the liquid vapor interface, where does boiling occur? Um, before it reaches that saturation temperature, maybe? Before it gets to the boiling point? Or I guess, I don't know, that doesn't make sense now that I say it. <laughs> no worries. Uh, Jacob, do you want to help her out? Do you have an idea of where boiling would occur in the system? Oh, my pot of boiling water. You're just asking where it would, it would occur? Or yeah, just where. I mean, it'll probably occur at the bottom. Well, actually, no, it'll occur at the top, at the interface between the liquid and the air. 
So at the, I guess, pot handle at the top of the system that you've drawn. You were so close. Boiling is going to occur at the solid liquid interface. Or I should say boiling occurs at the solid liquid interface. The question then becomes why? Why? Because the liquid comes in contact with a surface whose temperature T sub S is greater than that liquid's saturation temperature. Oof, doing all sorts of silly things today. What I mean by that then, if I look at the system and if, I was, if I'm gonna say boiling's gonna occur, the temperature here, T sub S, is gonna be greater than the T sat of the water in that system. Right, so TS is going to be greater, and in most cases, sufficiently greater than T sat. And just thinking in generalities, that boiling heat flux can be described in part by Newton's law of cooling. All right, because we're looking at heat transfer, the driving force for heat transfer are temperature gradients. And so I can say Q of boiling is equal to H times TS minus T sat or H times delta T excess, or the temperature gradient in excess of the saturation temperature. So quick recap, up here, we have evaporation. Down here, we have boiling. In between, for right now, we have water. We good? Should give you the John Madden, we get like X's and O's. So boiling, because engineers like to be complicated, can be broken up into several classifications. We have what's known as pool boiling. We have an absence of bulk flow. An example of this, you know, water in a pot.
This is differing from flow boiling. Where we have the presence of fluid flow. This is our famous flow in a pipe or heat exchanger. We can also consider what's known as subcooled boiling where the temperature of the liquid on average is below the saturation temperature. And this is, differs from what's known as saturated boiling, where the temperature of the liquid on average is approximately the saturation temperature. So let's take a look at first subcooled and we'll get into saturated. So I'm going to go back to my boiling water. What do you guys want to make today? I'm going to say TL is less than T set. And so if I'm going to look at a system, this system, and I have vapor that forms because I'm having boiling that occurs at that solid liquid interface. What happens to the bubble in this subcooled boiling system? See if we could call on. So let's say Pratik, what do you think? What's gonna happen to the bubble? Uh, I think the bubble is not going to rise above the surface since uh, the temperature average is less than the saturated temperature. Okay, so it's not so is it gonna just sit on the bottom? Uh, I think it's going to be somewhere in between. So it, all right, so the, va it, the vapor bubble is going to form. Is it going right. to st stay still or is it going to start floating up? I think it's going to start floating up, but it's still not going to go. All right, so what happens when it floats up? Who wants to, all right, you answered your question. Thank you. I don't, I don't want to pick on any one person. I'm an equal opportunity educator. Educator, I will pick on everybody. So Mackenzie, what do you think is going to happen as that bubble floats up? Uh, that it might expand a little bit. So the bubble's going to expand? Yes, sir. How is the bubble going to expand? That I'm not sure about. I'm just curious. Mitch, heat transfer, that's a good answer. All right, so 
I got a vapor bubble and I've got liquid. Which is going to have the higher temperature, the liquid or the vapor bubble? Uh, Kamisha, which is going to have a higher temperature, the vapor bubble or the liquid? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat your question? I couldn't hear you. It was coming in and out. Oh, okay, I think my computer's going into dumb battery mode. Um, so what is going to have a higher temperature, the vapor bubble or the liquid? The um, vapor bubble. Okay, so is heat transfer going to go into or out of the vapor bubble? So is, I guess is heat going to go into the vapor from the liquid or is heat going to go out of the vapor into the liquid? Out of the vapor into the liquid. All right. Wonderful. So next question then becomes for Cameron, what's going to happen to that vapor bubble as heat leaves it and goes into the liquid? Um. I mean, my guess, because it's not going to reach the top, so it has to go somewhere. My guess is going to pop. Yeah, so it's going to essentially collapse. When the temperature in that vapor bubble falls at the saturation temperature, it's going to collapse and it's going to become liquid again, right? So we're going to have a system where bubbles are going to form but they're not going to reach the surface because the temperature isn't high enough. And so to kind of wrap up and summarize that, I can say heat transfer. So Mitch, you were right, good job. Heat transfer does occur. From the vapor bubble, into the bulk liquid. However, the vapor will eventually condense and the bubble will collapse. Right. And so we call this nucleate boiling. The bulk, the, excuse me, the bubbles never effectively get to the surface of that system. And so what we also find is that this form of heat transfer, this nucleate heat transfer, two to nucleate boiling, is how the fluid, or I should say how the bulk fluid gains a majority of its heat. going towards that saturation temperature, right? And so what we find is those bubbles will rise and they'll collapse. And as it's happening, those bubbles essentially moving through the fluid is imparting the heat that's being essentially conducted um, through the bottom of the pan through the majority of the fluid. And so what we find is that boiling in this system, when we're really looking at pool boiling, but it's, it's the same for flow boiling, 
it exists in these stages. And so nucleate boiling is one of the pr primary stages. And I would argue one of the most important. But even, even if we looked at before nucleate boiling, if we just had a standard, you know, pot of water kind of thing, we would find that before the bottom reached the saturation, we would see convection currents form, right? You'd have hot fluid rise a little bit, cold fluid fall down. And so the initial stage is just natural convection. Then what we find is once the T of essentially the fluid temperature at the bottom reaches that saturation temperature, then we progress to the nucleate boiling stage. Let's say T at the bottom hits the saturation temperature. And so nucleate boiling occurs and exists until the bulk fluid temperature approaches the saturation temperature. And what do we think happens? Sorry, I keep having to jump back and forth. I'm sure that's probably getting annoying. When the, the average temperature equals the saturation temperature. So in this, what I'm saying is TL here is about saturation. What do I expect to happen to my bubbles now? All right, let's see who's next. Kiki, do you want to help him out? Help us out. I think that they would flow higher up than in the previous type. Do you think they'll hit the surface? Yes. I agree. All right. And so when we start approaching that saturation temperature, then the bubbles will reach the liquid vapor interface. And essentially evaporate and enter the vapor phase. So we're about out of time. So I'm going to leave you with one question. And that's with this, what happens if I continue to hate the fluid, even if TL is about T set. So I'm getting good boiling now. All my bubbles are getting to the surface. What's going to happen in this system? And particularly, what's going to happen close to that solid liquid interface? I think we're about out of time. So we'll answer that question 
on Thursday. Are there any more questions that you guys have for me? Are you guys comfortable with where we're at right now? All right, if not, I appreciate your patience this morning. Sorry, it was a little unorthodox. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. And as always, if you need anything, feel free to reach out to me. I'll probably hop on to office hours in about 15, 20 minutes. If you guys have any last minute questions for homework, want to do some answer checks, I'd be more than happy. Take care, guys. Have a great day. And don't forget to vote. Today's vote day. So hopefully you guys were able to do that. So take care. Is this like nuclear engineering? <laughs>